During an open forum at the 2012 AES convention, the panel members were asked to give some do's and don'ts about using equalizers. George Massenberg answered first, and his advice was clear and unambiguous. Don't. <laughs> now that may seem odd coming from the guy who was literally one of the inventors of the parametric equalizer. But what Mr. Massenberg and everyone else on that panel understands is that EQ is a tool to solve a problem. And just like all production tools, old and modern, they have a tendency to be overused, used as a crutch, or simply used for evil. Case in point, back in the 80s, digital signal processing exploded and everyone bought an SPX90 and said, holy crap, we can put effects on everything. And we did. But just like big hair, rolled up jeans, and thriller jackets, we look back on that time with nostalgia and a little bit of regret. What was I talking about? Right, EQ. So, you've probably heard some engineers say, I never use EQ, right? Well, I found that people often react to this statement with one of two extremes. They will either say, that's bullshit or they interpret the statement to mean that EQ is bad. Well, in my opinion, neither one of those extreme reactions are correct. It is absolutely true that some engineers never or hardly ever use EQ, and Al Schmidt is probably most famous for this. So you might be asking, how does he do this? Well, let's examine this against my nine puzzle pieces of professional recording. Musician, instrument, mic choice, placement, studio acoustics, recording system, monitoring system, control room acoustics, and skilled engineer. We'll just check that last one off right now. First, Mr. Schmidt works with the finest musicians who have the finest quality instruments. Also, he has a huge collection of microphones and decades of experience with mic placement, so he always knows what mic to use and where to put them. And also, he works at Capitol Studios in Los Angeles, so check, 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 and check. Al Schmidt doesn't use EQ because he doesn't need to. He is able to capture the sound the way it should sound in the mix, during the recording process. And this comes from his many years of experience and the fact that his working conditions are ideal. Here's what he had to say about that. The more successful you become in the business, the easier it is to do your job. You know, I mean, for me, I work at the best studios. I have the best musicians. I work with a good budget, so if I need anything, I, I get it. I have the best assistants in the world. And if I had to deal with what you're doing, if you're working in a neighborhood studio with the neighborhood band and the guy doesn't, his drums sound like ash cans and, you know, uh, I'm going to have trouble making a record with these guys, so. You see, it's all about the puzzle pieces. If any of them are missing, sometimes EQ is necessary. I mean, if the guitar player shows up with dead strings and refuses to change them, what choice do you have? But this last puzzle piece, that... That's the hardest one, getting yourself to the point where you can capture the sound right from the beginning, exactly as you want it to sound in the context of the final mix. That takes years of time and practice. Some of the best engineers in the world will do what they think is their best work in the tracking process, only to start mixing and go, you know, I still don't like that kick. And if you're mixing something that someone else recorded, all bets are off. Even Mr. Schmidt has said that he will use EQ when he's mixing something that he didn't record. So that brings us to the second extreme reaction to I don't use EQ, the conclusion that EQ must be bad. Well, it's not that it's bad per se, it's just that the results are so much better if you concentrate your efforts on capturing the sound right from the beginning by focusing on these. Let's try this for ourselves. In this recording, I have an SM58 stuck right in the sound hole. Well, it turns out that the low end is muddying up the mix, so let's EQ out that low end. Also, I'm not getting the clarity that I want, so I'll touch up the high end a bit. Now let's try a different approach, but this time I'll experiment a little and find the right placement and the right mic. Alright, so here's the new recording with no EQ. Here's the first recording, EQ. Another problem is that the performance of equalizers can vary widely. Some equalizers are exceptionally smooth and accurate, and others just sound yucky. That's why people still spend a lot of money on good quality equalizers, like this GML 8200. When the time comes to use an EQ, you want one that does the job without overly coloring the sound. And one last consideration for choosing to use an EQ 
is time. John Fields explains this best in his interview with Alan Parsons in his Art and Science of Sound Recording video series, which you should totally check out, by the way. I have been backed into a corner with a superstar vocal, and you only have an hour. You can't A, B. There's no time. And he's absolutely right. Not only that, if you're working with a band that doesn't exactly have a Capitol Records kind of budget, they might not want to be waiting around paying hourly while you're swapping mics around. In tight situations like that, you rely on your experience. What's worked before? Go with your gut and hope for the best, and if you have to touch it up with some EQ, so be it. But use those experiences to start building your own database of what works and what doesn't work. Take what you learn from your mixes and apply that to your future recordings. So once again, EQ is a tool to solve a problem. There are many situations where it's perfectly acceptable to use an equalizer, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. It doesn't make you a terrible engineer. And now it's time for viewer comments. You need more subscribers. I agree, and maybe you could help me out with that. You know, right there. It's just right, just right there. One little click. Won't even hurt. It's a button. <laughs> You're making it very hard for me to get back to studying pharmacology. That, that was a few months ago. I hope he passed. What is a douchebag, and do he really need make a video like a dum dum? And I should point out that douchebag and dum dum are capitalized. I, he doesn't see the irony in any of this, apparently. <laughs> this one's in all caps. Love your videos, never stop making them! Wow, oh, he, he seems really serious. <laughs> Star Trek, obviously. Star Wars is like a cartoon. What? Much anger in him. Like his father. It's Ghostbusters Igor! <laughs> I think you meant Egon? Uh, this is Egon. This is Igor. Igor. From Young Frankenstein. And, and I hope that's not what you meant. This guy is the best. You can see zero dislikes. Shh! They'll hear you! Please bring home coffee creamer. How did my wife get in here? <laughs> Info is good, but please lose the eight-year-old sh jokes. For f sake, you're like 40. First of all, I am not like 40. I'm 47. And secondly, Adulthood is overrated, and I'll check in with you in 20 years and see if you feel like growing up. If there's a difference, you will hear it, even on an iPhone. What kind of iPhone do you have? I appreciate that the audio in this video about audio sounds great, and that is about the best compliment I can get. And I appreciate you, all of you, for watching my videos. Thank you. This guy says, this is the John Green of audio. <laughs>